came to restore. Christ came to restore the broken relationship that was between man and God. Christ came to give us a right standing before God. And we see that he's going also not only restoring us to God, but he's also going to restore the creation. The Bible says that the creation was also cursed in the fall of Adam. And that Christ is also going to redeem the creation. And he's going to come and he's going to establish his kingdom. And and the kingdom that he's going to establish is going to be how it was supposed to be if man would not have fallen. We're going to have a righteous king that's going to reign over a righteous people that have been made righteous by the blood of the Lamb. And we would have known how far, how much God loves us because he was willing to send his son to die for us. How deep he was willing to go so that we may be saved. Amen. I love the way Paul starts this book. He has a way of teaching us that's incredible. And he starts out by preparing us and showing us a biblical fact that today has become corrupted. And I just want to read that uh, first paragraph, brother, that you read. It says, This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God our Savior and by Jesus Christ our hope. Now, he starts this letter by saying who appointed him. And this is so different than today. Because today, people want to hear of what man appointed you. Apostle so, prophet so and so. Who is your spiritual head? Now here, Paul outlines it clear. God is the one that called us. And we could see that in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 5. And the Bible says, before I formed you in the womb. I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. So we are called way before any man can commission us to go out there and do these things. God called us to do his work. This is something different that we see in the world. Everything in the world points to a man. Everything that has to do with God points to God. You see, even Jesus himself, everything that he spoke about, everything that he talked about, he always led it to God. That's why I don't understand, and you know, I don't want to be offensive to anybody. But how can we take pride to ourselves or give pride to other entities rather than God? I don't want to spend my time talking about devils, talking about different other things. I want to spend my time glorifying God. If we look through the scriptures and we see throughout the scriptures, the apostles and the man who were commissioned by God, they didn't spend time talking about any other, any other thing other than glorifying God. When we glorify God, we honor Him. And when we do God's work, it pleases Him. So why spend any other time glorifying any other thing? As far as me and my home, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Verse 4 says, I'm sorry, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, 
when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. We're going to see that in this book, there's about four times when Paul tells Timothy of a specific charge. What is it? A declaration, a specific uh, instruction that he's giving. And this is, in fact, one of the important points of this epistle. He says that he may, that, that Timothy might charge those not to teach any other doctrine. And, and when he's speaking about doctrine, he's speaking about any instruction that goes against the word of God other than what the apostles taught. And this is something that's very important because we're living in a time where Christians, they're not excited to hear about the, the truth of the scriptures. You know, people, they want to hear something that fancies them. They want to hear something that out of the ordinary, something that is strange and, and, and weird. Just like when, um, you know, when, when Paul the Apostle, when he meets those at Mars Hill when, and he meets the, the different, the Stoics and uh, the, 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 those, those philosophers that were there, they wanted to hear, they were curious to hear something strange. And that's what seems like to be the attitude in a lot of Christians today. They're not satisfied with hearing the basic instruction of the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is to edify us in godliness, to show us what are the things that need to be changed in our lives so that we can come to the Lord and that He may give us grace and empower us to be able to change. Because the world is not going to be impressed by the amount of knowledge we have. The way we shine light is by them seeing in us the character of Christ, the way a man treats his wife, the way a man treats his kids, the way he carries on his, he, he leads his household, the way we behave ourselves in public, the way we speak, the way we treat others. Those practical things are the things that testify of that we've been with the Lord, that we are the Lord's, that we are of the Lord's. And that's something that's very important because the Bible says that knowledge puffeth up. It doesn't, it, it does mean nothing. If I have all this great knowledge of uh, the scriptures and, and these mystical things, if godliness is not seen in my life. And he says, neither, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. We see that Paul was charging Timothy with the simplicity of preaching the word of God. He says, neither give he to fables. And that the Greek word uh, fables is muthos, which was where we get the words myths. And the word myth doesn't necessarily speak about something that's fantasy, but it's things that, that, that people are spoken that are hearsay. And he says, endless genealogies. And one of the things that we look in, into the um, uh, the Jewish culture, that it, it was very... Um, obsessed with genealogy, we're trying to find about your ancestors, where, where your, your your lineage come from. And why does Paul say that these things are not are not good? First of all, he says because they minister questions rather than godly edifying. See, when we start getting into strange doctrines and we start talking, instead of showing people Christ, then we can cause people to become confused. See, our job is to lead people to Christ. He says, rather than godly edifying, what does the word edifying mean? It means to build up, which is in faith. And he says, so do. We are to edify people until godliness, to show them Christ. I mean, we look at the New Testament, we look at the instruction that the apostles give us, and I would say the majority of the instruction that we get is how we should behave, what we should look forward to. What is Christ doing in us? What Christ did for us? What he's doing in us now and what he's going to do in the future? It all is about Christ. We look at the book of Revelation. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ, of who he is and what he has paid for and how he is the king of kings and lord of lords and he's going to take possession of that which he paid for in the cross of Calvary. That is what we need to be ministering as Bible teachers is showing people the scriptures and what the scriptures calls us to, to live a life of holiness, to live a life separated for the Lord, to live a life that is worthy of his calling. He paid for us with the blood 
of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. Amen. People don't want to hear the truth. They'd rather hear a lie or a story. And it's sad to say, but this is happening today in many churches. They try to explain the supernatural, explain the glory of God, explain the manifested presence of God. Yet these people don't even understand the natural world. People want to hear about special knowledge. And this is what we have today. This is why so many people seek mediums and other forms of witches and warlocks to try to find answers in their life rather than God. One of the problems with this is this will lead us away from God and not to God. See, one of the things that happen is that the devil will lure you away from the truth, believing these lies, which will eventually lead you into destruction. And look at what verse 5 says. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. And like this is what the HCSB says. Now, the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. You see that Paul here, he's saying, what is the purpose? This is, this is the goal. This is where it all culminates. This is the purpose of why I'm, t I'm, I'm telling you this. What is the end of the commandment? What is the fulfillment? First of all, he says, love out of a pure heart. Love out of a pure heart. To the King James is charity, but it's love. It's a Greek word, agape, speaking about God's love. It is that love, that selfless, sacrificial love, because love is total opposite of selfishness. See, love is the death of self and the giving of ourselves to God or the giving of ourselves to others. The Bible commands the husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, that he gave himself for her. The concept of love of the Bible, it's not what the, how the world defines it. It is a total death of self. It is giving ourselves to God completely, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. And he says love out of what? A pure heart. The point of what God is trying to transform is our hearts. To remove from us those motives, those evil motives, those evil thoughts, those evil things that are inside. He says, this is the purpose, is that we love from a pure heart, not one that is mixed, not one that is uh, partly for God and partly for the world, one that is clean before the Lord, one that knows that God sees him internally. God cares about our motives. And he says, not only from a pure heart, he says, but a good conscience. Good conscience. The conscience is very important in the scriptures. You know that the Bible says that we can also sin against our conscience. And when it's speaking about good conscience, it means that we're walking according to the convictions of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And not only doing that, but also conscience that we're free, that we're not manipulating others, that we're not, uh, that, that, that we've done the best we can to be right before God and be right before man. To do what is right, to not defraud anybody. And he says, in a sincere faith, or a faith unfeigned, meaning we're not hypocrites, that our actions line up with what we believe. You see, that's the biggest criticism of the Christians from the world. Oh, well, you call yourself a Christian, but you're a hypocrite. Why? Because you don't do the things that you believe, that you profess. And when we don't do the things that we profess, we take away the power of our testimony. We, we, our testimony discredits our words. We are to, to, to be genuine Christians and to live up to what we profess. Because that's, the, that's, that's what hypocrisy is. Hypocrisy is to proclaim something, proclaim that we're something, when in reality we're not and we don't show those things. 
When we look at the the goal of these things, the reason why Paul is instructing to 